So we are going to work together with the lottery today to look at some big thematic concepts. I put up in front of you the themes that we're looking at. And after we're done reading, you guys are going to get into your compass groups. You've already gotten into your color personality groups. You've already gotten into your Myers-Briggs groups. You have formed your own groups as far as your, um, help me remember, your Whitman analysis, no, not Whitman analysis, your unit three project groups. This is a group that you have not been in yet, okay? So in these groups, you guys are going through theme one, theme two, theme three, and you're going to be doing some of the things that you forgot to do in your research and your argumentative essays where you're giving me a quote and then three sentences of explanation. So as we're reading this together, I want you guys to keep those themes in mind. I'm actually going to play the audio because I have to read this five times during the day. So I'm going to play the audio and I will stop it. Again, it will behoove you or be in your best interest to take notes on this type of analysis because this is the type of analysis that I'm expecting from you in your body biography, your group project. So everyone should have a copy of the lottery. Raise your hand if you don't. All right, here we go. By Shirley Jackson. The morning of June 27th was clear and sunny with the fresh warmth of a full summer day. The flowers were blossoming profusely and the grass was richly green. The people of the village began to gather in the square between the post office and the bank around 10 o'clock. In some towns, there were so many people that the lottery took two days and had to be started on June 2nd. But in this village, where there was only about 300 people, the whole lottery took less than two hours, so it could begin at 10 o'clock in the morning and still be through in time to allow the villagers to get home for noon dinner. Okay, so the first thing that I would put in my notes is that obviously we have the exposition here. So plot pyramid-wise, we're at the beginning of the poem, or beginning of the poem, beginning of the short story, we're getting the background information, and this is actually thematically important because Shirley Jackson is telling us that this is something that one, happens every year, okay? So that's important, it's a ritual. And two, it happens all around the country. Now Shirley Jackson specifically is an American author. So she's talking about a ritual that happens throughout the United States. It is a universal activity that is a cultural representation, okay? So big thematic construct. What do we keep doing over and over again as a ritual, as a country. The children assembled first, of course. School was recently over for the summer, and the feeling of liberty sat uneasily on most of them. School was over, and the feeling of liberty was uneasy. Liberty is usually a positive connotation. Uneasy, obviously, is a negative connotation. So what is the, listen uh, carefully, because this is an important vocabulary term, aesthetic effect. When you have a word like liberty that has a positive connotation next to a word like uneasy that has a negative connotation, the aesthetic effect is supposed to be, it's supposed to make you feel uneasy because it doesn't fit. It's like cacophony. Remember we talked about cacophony with Walt Whitman? It's like cacophony. It's supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. So the aesthetic, uh, uh, the aesthetic ex uh, effect is supposed to be as you are entering this short story, this feels eerie. This feels uncomfortable. They tended to gather together quietly for a while before they broke into boisterous play, and their talk was still of the classroom and the teacher, of books and reprimands. Bobby Martin had already stuffed his pockets full of stones, and the other boys soon followed his example, selecting the smoothest and roundest stones. Bobby and Harry Jones and Dickie Delacroix, the villagers pronounced his name Delacroix, eventually made a great pile of stones in one corner of the square and guarded it against the raids of the other boys. The girls stood aside, talking among themselves, looking over their shoulders at rolled in the dust or clung to the hands of their older brothers or sisters. Soon, the men began to gather, surveying their own children, speaking of planting and rain, tractors and taxes. They stood together, away from the pile of stones in the corner, and their jokes were quiet and they smiled rather than laughed. Okay, so exposition, again, going back to thematic concepts, what we are looking at here, one, is that this is supposed to be representative of, put your phone away, the entire United States, okay? So the entire United States is supposed to be this big melting pot of different types of people. Look at the names that are listed there. You see how all the names are sort of different, right? We've got Dickie Delacroix, 
we have these very American names. It's supposed to be representative of that. So two things happening. One, the boys are setting up stones and this is supposed to be playful for them. And everyone is sort of standing around quietly discussing normal everyday things. This is supposed to represent a typical rural American town, okay? The women wearing the faded house dresses and sweaters came shortly after their men folk. They greeted one another and exchanged bits of gossip as they went to join their husbands. Soon the women standing by their husbands began to call to their children and the children came reluctantly, having to be called four or five times. Bobby Martin ducked under his mother's grasping hand and ran, laughing, back to the pile of stones. His father spoke up sharply, and Bobby came quickly and took his place between his father and his oldest brother. The lottery was conducted, as were the square dances, the teen club, the Halloween program, by Mr. Summers, who had time and energy to devote to civic activities. He was a round-faced, jovial man, and he ran the coal business, and people were sorry for him because he had no children and his wife was a school. So he was supposed to represent the typical person who is in civil service, meaning that they're able to dedicate massive amounts of time to the community because they don't have a family of their own. When he arrived in the square, carrying the black wooden box, there was a murmur of conversation among the villagers, and he waved and called, little late today, folks. In your notes, write this down, black wooden box. The fact that he's carrying this cer ceremonious black wooden box should be a hint to you, hey, this thing is important. So remember, a symbol is a concrete object that stands for an abstract idea. A box is a concrete object. You need to start asking yourself, what is the abstract idea that the box represents? Remember yesterday and the day before we talked about with the Whitman analysis, the spider, the concrete object of the spider represents the soul. You guys came up with your own poems in which you created a creature that's supposed to stand for an abstract object. So ask yourself while we're listening to this, hey, what is the abstract idea behind this particular symbol? The postmaster, Mr. Graves, followed him, carrying a three-legged stool, and the stool was put in the center of the square, and Mr. Summers set the black box down on it. The villagers kept their distance, leaving a space between themselves and the stool, and when Mr. Summers said, some of you fellows want to give me a hand, there was a hesitation before two men, Mr. Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, came forward to hold the box setting on the stool while Mr. Summers stirred up the papers inside it. The original paraphernalia for the lottery had been lost long ago, and the black box now resting on the stool had been put into use even before Old Man Warner. What's his name? Old Man what? Warner. What do you think he's going to do? His name is Warner. He's probably going to warn them of something. The oldest man in town was born. Mr. Summers spoke frequently to the villagers about making a new box, but no one liked to upset even as much tradition as was presented by the black box. A symbol is a concrete object that stands for an abstract idea. Reread that sentence. The one that was just read. Take a, take a flying guess, a flying leap of faith. What do you think the abstract idea is that the black box is supposed to represent? Indeed, tradition, exactly right. It would behoove you or be in your best interest to write that down. There was a story that the present box had been made with some pieces of the box that had preceded it, the one that had been constructed when the first people settled down to make a village here. Every year after the lottery, Mr. Summers began talking again about a new box, but every year the subject was allowed to fade off without anything being done. The black box grew shabbier each year. By now, it was no longer completely black, but splintered badly along one side to show their original wood color, and in some places, faded or stained. Mr. Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, held the black box securely on the stool until Mr. Summers had stirred the papers thoroughly with his hand. Because so much of the ritual had forgotten or discarded, Mr. Summers had been successful in having slips of paper substituted for the chips of wood that had been used for generations. Chips of wood, Mr. Summers had argued, had been all very well when the villager was tiny, but now that the population was more than 300 and likely to keep on growing, it was necessary to use something that would fit more easily into the black box. So did they change the black box? No. 
did they change the ritual around the black box, according to what we've read? A little bit, but they haven't actually changed anything except for what's inside the black box itself, okay? The night before the lottery, Mr. Summers and Mr. Graves made up the slips of paper and put them in the box. And it was then taken to the safe of Mr. Summers' coal company and locked up until Mr. Summers was ready to take it to the square ne the next morning. The rest of the year, the box was put away. Sometimes one place, sometimes another. It had spent one year in Mr. Graves' barn and another year underfoot in the post office. And sometimes it was set on a shelf in the Martin grocery and left there. There was a great deal of fussing to be done before Mr. Summers declared the lottery open. There were the lists to make up of heads of families, heads of households in each family, members of each household in each family. There was a proper swearing in of Mr. Summers by the postmaster as the official of the lottery. At one time, some people remembered, there had been a recital of some sort performed by the official of the lottery, a perfunctory tuneless chant that had been routed off duty each year. Some people believed that the official of the lottery used to stand just so when he said or sang it. Others believed that he was supposed to walk among the people. But years and years ago, this part of the ritual had been allowed to lapse. There had been also a ritual salute, which the official of the lottery had to use in addressing each person who came up to draw from the box. But this also had changed with time. Until now, it was felt necessary only for the official to speak to each person approaching. Mr. Summers was very good at all of this. In his clean white shirt and blue jeans, with one hand resting carelessly on the black box, he seemed very proper and important as he talked intermittently to Mr. Graves and the Martins. Okay, so the narrator said that word wrong. I just want to point out, because it's an SAT word, interminably. The word is interminably, and it means seeming to never end. If something seems interminable, it seems like it's never going to end. Okay, so... We have this conversation taking place between the official and the people who are, are participating in the ritual, and it seems to be never ending. So this is supposed to mood, create a sense of anticipation. So let's go back and think about the setting of this and how it might relate to one of these themes. Okay, the setting starts off weird, right? We're supposed to feel uncomfortable. There's a bunch of boys defending a giant pile of rocks. There are older people who are standing around talking quietly. And then ceremoniously, the person who's supposed to take care of all of the civic duties of the entire town comes down with this black box. They have used this black box for as long as they can remember. It's splintered, it's falling apart. And the only thing that he can actually convince them to change is to stop using tiny pieces of wood and instead use pieces of paper. But obviously this has been going on for a very long time. In fact, if you look at the previous paragraph, there's a whole bunch of mystery about how all of this originally started going, right? So for that reason, we have this situation where we as the audience feel uncomfortable. What is about to happen? The sense that you're supposed to have is anticipatory, right? You're anticipating, but also a slight sense of dread. Something is very wrong here. Just as Mr. Summers finally let off talking and turned to the assembled villagers, Mrs. Hutchison came hurriedly along the path to the square, her sweater thrown over her shoulders and slid into place in the back of the crowd. Clean forgot what day it was, she said to Mrs. Delacroix, who stood next to her, and they both laughed softly. Thought my old man was out back stacking wood, Mrs. Hutcherson went on. And then I looked out the window and the kids were gone, and then I remembered it was the 27th and came a running. She dried her hands on her apron, and Mrs. Delacroix said, You're in time, though. They're still talking away up there. Mrs. Hutcherson craned her neck to see through the crowd and found her husband and children standing near the front. She tapped Mrs. Delacroix on the arm as a farewell and began to make her way through the crowd. The people separated good humoredly to let her through. Two or three people said in voices just loud enough to be heard across the crowd, Here comes your Mrs. Hutchinson. And, Bill, she made it after all. Mrs. Hutchinson reached her husband, and Mr. Summers, who had been waiting, said cheerfully, Thought we were going to have to get on without you, Tessie. Mrs. Hutchinson said, grinning, Wouldn't have me leave me dishes in the sink now, would you, Joe? The soft laughter ran through the crowd as the people stirred back into position after Mrs. Hutchinson's arrival. Well now, Mr. Summers said soberly, guess we better get started, get this over with so we can get back to work. Anybody in here? Dunbar, several people said. Dunbar, Dunbar. Mr. Summers consulted his list. Clyde Dunbar, he said. That's right. He's broke his leg, hasn't he? Who's drawing for him? Me, I guess, a woman said. 
and Mr. Summers turned to look at her. Life draws for her husband, Mr. Summers said. Don't you have a grown boy to do it for you, Janie? Although Mr. Summers and everyone else in the village knew the answer perfectly well, it was the business of the official of the lottery to ask such questions formally. Mr. Summers waited with an expression of polite interest while Mrs. Dunbar answered. Horace is not but 16 yet, Mrs. Dunbar said regretfully. Guess I got to fill in for the old man this year. So you are not excluded from the law. Your family is not excluded from the lottery, even if there's an injury or an illness. It is always going to be the tradition of that. You should probably write this down. The tradition of the man to take the place in the lottery, to do his, his duty in the lottery. If the man is not available, then that means that it is the job of the wife, unless there is a boy who is old enough to take the place of his mother. So talk about the idea of tradition. Like that is a very tradition, traditional patriarchal understanding. Okay. Right, Mr. Summers said. He made a note on the list he was holding. Then he asked, Watson boy drawing this year? A tall boy in the crowd raised his hand. Here, he said, I'm drawing for my mother and me. He blinked his eyes nervously and ducked his head as several voices in the crowd said things like, good fellow, lad, and good to see your mother's got a man to do it. Well, Mr. Summers said, guess that's everyone. Old man Mortar make it? Here, a voice said, and Mr. Summers nodded. A sudden hush fell on the crowd as Mr. Summers cleared his throat and looked at the list. All ready, he called. Now, I'll read the names, heads of families first, and the men come up and take a paper out of the box. Keep the paper folded in your hand without looking at it until everyone has had a turn. Everything clear? The people had done it so many times that they only half listened to the directions. Most of them were quiet, wetting their lips, not looking around. So again, anticipation, right? So when... The author is describing what they are doing that is supposed to help you understand how you as the reader are feeling. The fact that they're looking around nervously, the fact that they're very quiet and solemn and wetting their lips. This is supposed to be a sense of anticipation. Then Mr. Summers raised one hand high and said, Adams. A man disengaged himself from the crowd and came forward. Hi, Steve, Mr. Summers said, and Mr. Adams said, hi, Joe. They grinned at one another humorlessly and nervously. Then Mr. Adams reached into the black box, took out a folded paper. He held it firmly by one corner as he turned and went hastily back to his place in the crowd where he stood a little apart from his family, not looking down at his hand. Allen, Mr. Summer said, Anderson, Bentham. Look at that last one, Bentham. You guys remember the video yesterday? John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. They were the philosophers associated with utilitarianism. That is a hint. It is, as the literary element, it will behoove you to write this down, allusion with an A, not I illusion with an I, as in a magic trick, although it's sort of a magic trick. That is an allusion to Jeremy Bentham, one of the fathers of utilitarianism. And as we discussed yesterday, utilitarianism is the sacrifice of one for the good of many. That's a hint that Shirley Jackson is giving you. Seems like there's no time at all between lotteries anymore, Mrs. Delacroix said to Mrs. Graves in the back row. Seems like we got through with the last one only last week. Time sure goes fast, Mrs. Graves said. Clark, Delacroix, there goes my old man, Mrs. Delacroix said. She held her breath while her husband went forward. Dunbar, Mr. Summers said, and Mrs. Dunbar went steadily to the box, while one of the women said, go on, Janie, and another said, there she goes. Where next, Mrs. Graves said. She watched while Mr. Graves came around from the side of the box, greeted Mr. Summers gravely. What do you see repeated? There's a word repeated in that sentence. Graves, what do you think that's hinting at? Dying. Yeah, somebody dying or death. It selected a slip of paper from the box. By now, all through the crowd, there were men holding the small folded papers in their large hand, turning them over and over nervously. Mrs. Dunbar and her two sons stood together. Mrs. Dunbar holding the slip of paper. Harbert, Hutchinson, 
Get up there, Bill, Mrs. Hutchinson said, and the people near her laughed. Jones. They do say, Mr. Abbott said to old man Warner, who stood next to him, that over in the North Village, they're talking of giving up the lottery. Uh-oh. So there is a rumor of tradition changing somewhere else. Old man Warner started, pack of crazy fools, he said, listening to the young folks, nothing good enough for them. Next thing you know, they'll be wanting to go back to living in caves. Nobody work anymore. Lived that way for a while. Used to be a saying about lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. First thing you know, we'd all be eating stewed chickweed and acorns. There's always been a lottery, he added petulantly. Bad enough to see young Joe Summers up there joking everybody. Okay, so I need to dissect this paragraph with you because symbolically speaking, metaphorically speaking, it's very important. Mr. Adams, which by the way, if we're talking about an American author, most likely Adams represents the historical figure of John Adams. If you're talking about something famous, what literary element is that? It's, I just gave you one. Allusion, exactly, allusion, okay? So it says, old man Warner snorted. I already told you guys that Warner is going to warn, right? Pay, uh, pack of crazy fools. Listening to the young people, so obviously this is an old person, and by the way, this goes on from generation to generation, who's downcasting against the young people. Nothing is good enough for them. So the lottery that we have now, they want to change it because they, they think that it's not good enough. Then he warns them, next thing you know, They'll want to go back to living in caves. To old man Warner and to people who are participating in this tradition, doing the lottery is the way you should write this down. The lottery equals civility. It is how we maintain society. If we don't have something like the lottery, if we don't have rituals, then we're all just going to be savages living in caves. Then he says, without the lottery, people won't work anymore. Okay. Let's see how they do living that way for a while. Then he brings up an old saying, lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. So again, old man Warner warns, you should write this down, lottery equals good crops. Lottery equals good crops. So it starts off that the lottery is about being in a civil society. We do this because it's the way that it's always been done and that's appropriate and that's how we maintain society and we don't become savages living in, in caves. Next assertion, we do this because if we don't, then you know the weather gods may be angry that we don't do the lottery and therefore we don't have enough food. Okay, so a little bit of like suspicion there. Uh, first thing you know, we'll be eating chickweed and acorn. So now he's saying not only are we, we don't have enough food, right? We have to eat chickweed and acorns, but also we're going back to being savages again because we don't even have enough crops to feed everybody. There's always been a lottery, he added petulantly. And petulantly is another SAT vocab word, petulantly, acting like a spoiled child. We saw petulantly in the crucible as well, all right, when uh, Reverend Paris was admonishing um, Putnam. Bad enough to see Joe Summers up there joking with everyone. So old man Warner wants even more pomp and circumstance to go along with this. Some places have already quit lotteries, Mrs. Adams said. Nothing but trouble in that, old man Warner said stoutly. Pack of young fools. Martin and Bobby Martin watched his father go forward. Overdyke? Percy? I wish they'd hurry, Mrs. Dunbar said to her older son. I wish they'd hurry. They're almost through, her son said. You get ready to run, tell Dad, Mrs. Dunbar said. Mr. Summers called his own name and then stepped forward precisely and selected a slip from the box. Then he called Warner. 77th year I've been in the lottery, old man Warner said as he went through the crowd. 77th time. Seven is always a what number? Lucky. So he's always been, old man Warner has always been lucky. If he's always been lucky and he's never had to worry about the consequences of the lottery, that might be one of the reasons, you should probably write that down. That might be one of the reasons that he's adamantly protecting the lottery. Watson, the tall boy came awkwardly through the crowd. Someone said, don't be nervous, Jack. And Mr. Summer said, take your time, son. Zanini, 
After that, there was a long pause, a breathless pause, until Mr. Summers, holding his slip of paper in the air, said, All right, fellows. For a minute, no one moved, and then all the slips of paper were opened. Suddenly, all the women began to speak at once, saying, Who is it? Who's got it? Is it the Dunbars? Is it the Watsons? Then the voices began to say, It's Hutchinson. It's Bill. Bill Hutchinson's got it. Go to your father, Mrs. Dunbar said to her older son. People began to look around to see the Hutchinsons. Bill Hutchinson was standing quiet, staring down at the paper in his hand. Suddenly, Tessie Hutchinson shouted to Mr. Summers. He didn't give him time enough to take any paper he wanted. I saw you. It wasn't fair. All right. Up until this point, has Tessie Hutchinson spoken out against the lottery? No. Okay. Let's talk about names for a minute. And I'm going to get super, super literary nerdy with you for a moment just because I like it. All right. Bill. Bill is not actually a full name. What is Bill derived from? What name does it come from? William. Let's break William apart. William is spelled W-I-L-L-I-A-M. So it's actually Will I Am. Bill is a subset of the free will of man. Whenever you see the name Bill or William or Billy, that is the author saying this person is supposed to represent the everyday person, the everyday man. So Shirley Jackson, and Stephen King does this all the time, so you know I love it. Shirley Jackson, that's why he uses that name more than any other name in his, in his stories and in his books, is saying that this type of situation with the lottery could happen to anyone. To anyone. Even old man Warner, who 77 times has never had to worry about it. Bill Hutchinson, I'm so glad to see you guys furiously writing that down. That is so very important. It's supposed to represent the any person in American culture, in an American rural town. Be a good sport, Tessie, Mrs. Delacroix called. And Mrs. Graves said, all of us took the same chance. Shut up, Tessie, Billy Hutchinson said. Well, everyone, Mr. Summer said, that was done pretty fast. And now we've got to be hurrying a little more to get it done in time. He consulted his next list. Bill, he said, you draw for the Hutchinson family. You got any other households in the Hutchinsons? Miss Don and Ava, Mrs. Hutchinson yelled, make them take their chance. Daughters draw with their husband's family's test. So this is the mother, and she's trying to throw her own daughter under the bus with her. Okay, but her daughter has married. So like when I got married, I took my husband's name, so I would draw in the lottery with my husband. Okay. Tessie, Mr. Summers said gently, you know that as well as anyone else. It wasn't fair, Tessie said. I guess not, Joe, Bill Hutchinson said regretfully. My daughter draws with her husband's family. That's only fair. And I've got no other family except the kids. Do you think it's coincidence that Tessie has the name Tessie and she's testing to see how far she can get away with things? Probably not a coincidence. Should probably write that down. Tessie is testing the system to see how far she can get away from the consequence. Then, as far as drawing for families is concerned, it's you. Mr. Summers said an explanation. And as far as drawing for households is concerned, that's you too, right? Right, Bill Hutchinson said. How many kids, Bill? Mr. Summers asked formally. Three, Bill Hutchinson said. There's Bill Jr. and Nancy and little Dave and Tessie and me. All right, then, Mr. Summers said. Here, you got their tickets back? Mr. Gage nodded and held up the slips of paper. Put them in the box then, Mr. Summers directed. Take bills and put it in. So it's no coincidence that Mr. Graves is the one who drops the papers in the box? I think we ought to start over, Mrs. Hutcherson said as quietly as she could. I tell you, it wasn't fair. There she didn't give him time again. enough to choose. Everybody saw that. Mr. Graves had selected the five slips and put them in the box. And he dropped all the papers but those onto the ground where the breeze caught them and lifted them off. Listen, everybody, Mrs. Hutchinson was saying to the people around her. Test, test. Ready, Bill? Mr. Summers asked. And Bill Hutchinson, with one quick glance around at his wife and children, nodded. Remember, Mr. Summers said, take the slips and keep them folded until each person has taken one. Harry, you help little Dave. 
Mr. Graves took the hand of the little boy who came willingly with him up to the box. Take a paper out of the box, Davy, Mr. Summer said. Davy put his hand into the box and laughed. Take just one paper, Mr. Summer said. Harry, you hold it for him. So a child who is not even old enough to draw a slip of paper out of a box is being asked to participate. Why? Because it's the way we've always done it. Mr. Graves took the child's hand and removed the folded paper from the tight fist and held it while little Dave stood next to him and looked up at him wonderingly. Nancy next, Mr. Summer said. Nancy was 12, and her school friends breathed heavily as she went forward, switching her skirt, and took a slip daintily from the box. Bill Jr., Mr. Summer said, and Billy, his face red and his feet over large, near knocked the box over as he got a paper out. Tessie, Mr. Summer said. She hesitated for a minute, looking around defiantly, and then set her lips and went up to the box. She snatched the paper out and held it behind her. Bill, Mr. Summer said, and Bill Hutchison reached into the box and felt around, bringing his hand out at last with a slip of paper in it. The crowd was quiet. A girl whispered, I hope it's not Nancy. And the sound of the whisper reached the edge of the crowd. It's not the way it used to be, old man Warner said clearly. People ain't the way they used to be. All right, Mr. Summers said, open the papers. Harry, you open little Dave's. Mr. Graves opened the slip of paper and there was a general sigh through the crowd as he held it up and everyone could see that it was blank. Nancy and Bill Jr. opened theirs at the same time and both beamed and laughed, turning around to the crowd and holding their slips of paper above their heads. Tessie, Mr. Summers said, there was a pause and then Mr. Summers looked at Bill Hutchinson and Bill unfolded his paper and showed it. It was blank. It's Tessie, Mr. Summers said, and his voice was hushed. Show us your paper, Bill. Bill Hutchinson went over to his wife and forced the slip of paper out of her hand. It had a black spot on it. The black spot Mr. Summers had made the night before with a heavy pencil in the coal company office. Bill Hutchinson held it up and there was a stir in the crowd. All right, folks, Mr. Summers said. Let's finish quickly. Although the villagers had forgotten the ritual and lost their original black box, they still remembered to use stones. The pile of stones the boys had made earlier was ready. There were stones on the ground with the blowing scraps of paper that had come out of the box. Delacroix selected a stone so large she had to pick it out with both hands and turned to Mrs. Dunbar. Come on, she said, hurry up. So the same woman she was just laugh laughing and joking with. And she tried to find a rock, a stone so large that she could barely hold it. The same woman that she was just laughing and joking with. Mr. Dunbar had small stones in both hands, and she said, grasping for Beth, I can't run at all. You have to go ahead, and I'll catch up with you. The children had stones already, and someone gave little Davy Hutchinson a few pebbles. That's horrifying. A baby, a little kid, is given stones. Tessie Hutchinson was in the center of a cleared space by now, and she held her hands up desperately as the villagers moved in on her. It isn't fair, she said. A stone hit her on the side of the head. Old man Warner was saying, come on, come on, everyone. Steve Adams was in the front of the crowd of villagers with Mrs. Graves beside him. It isn't fair, it isn't right, Mrs. Hutchison screamed. And then they were upon her. What happened to her? She didn't die. What happened to her? They killed her. They stoned her to death. They, yes, they gave stones to her child. Everyone in the village said, this is what we have always done. We have to sacrifice one person every year because if we don't, society will fall apart. Our traditions will go away. The corn won't grow. We'll starve to death and we'll live in a bunch of caves. Think about that. The box is supposed to represent the idea of ritual. What they're doing is supposed to represent the idea of doing something over and over again without questioning it, even if it means sacrificing one person every year. What would have happened if little Davy, Davy had it? Would they have killed him too? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Keep those in front of you because I'm going to give you guys, <laughs> I'm going to give you guys.